Hi, I'm Jessica Brillhart. I'm the principal filmmaker for virtual reality at Google. Um, today I'm going to talk a lot about uh, how story, uh, experience, and our existence all kind of interconnect uh, with one another and how they all validate one another um, and how they lead to really great uh, artistic and creative projects. Um, and uh, I hope that people take away from this talk that you know, VR and virtual reality is actually much more complicated than what it may appear to be. ก็ต่อไปนี้นะคะก็ถึงคราววิทยากรสาวท่านเดียวของเรานะคะใน2วันนี้ก็สาวท่านนี้นะคะเป็นหัวหน้าฝ่ายสร้างภาพยนตร์นะคะ VR ของ Google เป็นบุคคลสําคัญในการสร้างภาพยนตร์ทั้งขนาดสั้นและก็ภาพยนตร์สารคดีนะคะที่ได้รับรางวัลหลายชิ้นมากเลยนะคะแล้วก็กํากับภาพยนตร์เรื่อง World Tour นะคะซึ่งเป็นภาพยนตร์เรื่องแรกของโลกที่ผลิตด้วยกล้อง Jump ซึ่งเป็นต้นแบบของกล้อง VR นะคะปัจจุบันเธอก็ได้เดินทางไปทั่วโลกเลยนะคะเพื่อที่จะทําภาพยนตร์และทดลองสิ่งต่างๆและสร้างความเข้าใจเกี่ยวกับเครื่องมือใหม่อย่าง VR ก็เตรียมตัวพบกับท่านนี้เลยนะคะวิทยากรคนนี้ I would like to invite Miss Jessica Brillhart the principal of filmmaker of VR at Google up on stage as our next speaker please welcome keep your hands up for Miss Jessica Brillhart It's so weird to see my photo like float onto the screen like that. It's like ah oh, god, um, and to also see myself on the screen. Okay, good. Um, hi everybody. Um, I am uh, I'm Jessica Brillhart. I I'm a principal filmmaker for virtual reality um, at Google, um, which is a small little company. Um, big big promise though. I think we're we're gonna we're gonna make it someday. Um, and uh, just to give you some kind of backdrop, can we lower the lights a little bit on the on the audience, just so that you guys can see stuff better. Um, so before VR, uh, I was a filmmaker. Uh, I've been at Google for seven years now, um, and uh, you know, I, I was what they—I think they consider their like first like artsy filmmaker. I think. Um, so I would actually um, film, you know, our CEOs, um, and uh, but beyond the CEOs, I actually uh, was really focused on trying to find the people that actually use this stuff. Um, Kind of the amateur astronomers, the photographers, the the programmers, the people that are actually trying to use technology uh, and leverage technology in really amazing ways. Um, this is uh, an example of some groups of uh, amateur astronomers uh, from around the world, and this actually happened in real life. They actually found a way to pipe in Saturn uh, into a hangout, and I got to catch that, um, which is amazing. You just be online and you can see Saturn. It's insane. Um, And I also used, you know, my knowledge of other films in the past that I was really into. Um, this is from D. A. Pennebaker's Subterranean. Well, this is a Bob Dylan music video that D. A. Pennebaker uh, directed, um, which was Subterranean Homesick Blues, where Bob Dylan is flipping out these cue cards, right? Um, and some of the cards are literal, like they'll say exactly what he's singing, and other cards are not so literal. They're more about metaphor and context and things that gives it uh, give it a little bit more information. So I thought, well, what you know, flipping cue cards and searching sort of similar. We do things online when we search um, that bring nuance and context to what we're searching for. So you know, eleven dollar bills is what he sings, and you only got ten. It shows you twenty dollar bills. Um, and so I thought, well, you only got ten. Um, we misspell sometimes, right? And then we actively click on what we actually meant when we said it. Um, You know what is it like to uh, introduce uh, your new boyfriend to your dad online? You know, um, what's that like? Um, and it's also you know nuances of like you know what, what? How do we show gratitude? We don't capitalize words. We we don't really spell things out correctly. We don't use punctuation. Sometimes you know that little sign, like little thing that says, you know, typing dot dot dot, and you're waiting for that person to send. You know how long that takes. What the emotion is behind that sort of thing, and what's grieving online? How do we connect? The silences being more important than you know words that we say or sounds that we make. How do we pause? Um, I was also I got to be a muppeteer uh, in a in a hangout uh, with uh, with the Muppets, which was pretty cool. Um, and I really thought the technology was quite beautiful. And as a filmmaker, you know, I'm not a brilliant data. Artist or a kinetic sculptor, or you know, I, I, I want to 
and I definitely want Timor now. But I, I really, when I see technology, especially old school technology, I really think about how it moves um, cinematically, how can I capture it so it's not like some sort of really dry science video where it's so cold and kind of weird looking and you just don't care. It's like, how, how can we connect to this stuff? Um, and again, it's not just about that. It's also about the people making this stuff, the people that care about it. Um, and so, you know, I would take the engineers and I would put them in their quantum computers that they, they built, um, which was a little awkward, but I made them do it. And, uh, or I would explain quantum principles using pizza bagels. Um, and this is an example of superposition. Thank you, interpreters. You, you know, we talked about this. So um, superposition is this idea that um, something can be in uh, two states at the same time. So, you know, if you think about binary computing, it's one or zero. And the idea that you can have it be one and zero at the exact same time. Um, so you can be pizza, you can be a bagel, you can be a pizza bagel. Um, so I explained very complex engineering principles to everyone else um, that were easy for the engineers to understand, but maybe more complex for other folks. Um, and some of these people you've seen before, I'd, be, I'd film very brilliant people like Ray Kurzweil and Jeff Dean and big blue chairs and Jeffrey Hinton um, made them laugh, you know, embraced the fact that they were human, put them in kind of weirder situations, things that they weren't accustomed to, because what happens at tech companies is you see these talking heads and lower thirds. It's so boring. These people are humans, right? And they have stories about how they grew up and what makes them tick. That's very important. And it's stuff that exists in technology, but we forget it because we're very efficient uh, beings. Um, so I was having a, a, a pretty great time, you know. <laughs> I finally was getting into the groove. It was about five years into it. Took a bit of time to get everyone on the same page about what I was doing there, but um, you know, and I, I was doing okay. And you know, things seemed peaceful and nice, which is usually a really great indication that something else is going to completely knock you off of that and um, destroy everything. And um, that's what happened. I got uh, <laughs> an email. Uh, from a group of engineers, and this is the original email, about a year and a half ago, uh, which says, hi, my, you know, hey Jessica, my name is Dante, I'm working with a team building a next generation camera capable of shooting 360 degrees. I'd love to learn more about the types of films you're working on and see if there is a possibility for us to work together to develop some creative immersive content, because there's an exclamation point. Um, thoughts. I, I didn't really have a lot of thoughts then, uh, I, but I, I, I do have quite a few of them now. Uh, and I, you know, and I was like, well, you know, I'm doing this other stuff, but I mean, this 360 thing seems really interesting. I, and and you know, in, in, at Google, um, again, small company, so you can imagine this must be very difficult, uh, certain groups don't talk to each other, because it's like, unless they work together. So as a filmmaker, I only really talked to engineers when I was, when I was you know, filming them or talking about their products or kind of unpacking what their stories were. But otherwise, generally, we, we didn't really converse as much. And here, out of nowhere, this group of engineers finds me. Um, so I follow the breadcrumbs, I guess. Uh, and I went to Seattle, where these engineers were, and I found this. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> Okay, you know, like some numbers are scribbled. That's actually a result of me because we had misnumbered them and disordered them. And if you know anything about VR, which I don't know how many of you do, um, it's usually multiple cameras, uh, GoPros, generally. This is 16 GoPros. And they're not synced, which means that um, each one works independently of each other. So you go through and be like, record, 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 record. Now, um, nowadays, I feel like a you know older person. I'm like back in my day, they were unsynced. But you know nowadays, they actually are synced to one camera. So you just press record once and it works. Um, so anyway, this is what I, I thought it was one of the most you know you have those moments. You're like this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, and uh, you know, yeah. So um, and, and this is actually another one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen moments, um, which is the group of engineers that uh, were working on this camera and the software that stitches all the camera feeds together. So it's a seamless 360 environment. So if I'm looking this way and I turn, I don't see like a line between the cameras. I see something that looks very much like real life. Um, they filmed a bunch of things and they, some of them were, were okay. They're like outside University of Washington or at, in this practice space. Um, 
But then they showed me this. And I got to say, after working for like, you know, at this point, five or six years at Google, trying to make stories about technology resonate, I saw this and I was like, you did it. <laughs> you just turned on the camera and you just did it. This is incredible. And it felt great. And I didn't know why. And I knew that at that point that they showed me that, that I had to help them. <laughs> because it felt great. I mean, it's just turning on the camera for the first time, but it's, it's, there's something special about this. Um, something about what the medium was doing that I hadn't ever achieved or felt in film, and I, I wanted to know why. Um, so since then, I've been traveling like a crazy person <laughs> and filming all sorts of stuff all over, all over the world um, with uh, whatever permeation of the rig was at my side. Now, um, the great part about having access to this camera and, or this rig and the great part about filming as much as I have is I don't go out and expect to know anything. I let what I film tell me what is happening in the medium. It, it, the medium sort of emerges um, and lets me know what, it, what might be working. Um, and, and what's been sort of happening in the field of virtual reality is that, you know, we all want answers yesterday. We all, we all want to, and the biggest one being, we, all, we want to tell a story. How do we tell a story in VR? And it's one of the most annoying questions I've ever heard. Because as someone who's making content, which, you know, it, it's, you're, you're just trying to figure out how to even run the camera, why the, you know, making sure the technology works. There are a lot of things that happen that as a filmmaker you expect would happen one way and, th and it doesn't. It completely just doesn't work. And you're filled with anxiety and you don't know if it's actually going to work. You don't know if anyone's going to care. Um, which is like any medium, I guess, but um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there's a lot going on. So um, I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about how story is something that kind of comes from understanding, having a deeper understanding of things that come before that, and to give you some insight in terms of what is happening in VR from, from my perspective, and to give you some sort of platform so if you do want to work in this medium, you have something to latch onto. Not pragmatics, not, you know, you're there. It's, it's about you know, what, what does this medium want from creators? What, what, makes, it, what makes it tick? Um, so to start, you know, Carl Sagan, because why not? Um, if you want to bake an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. Um, if you want to create something specific, you got to know what you're working with. You got to know the scope of, of what, what this stuff entails. Um, so, you know, if you were to change it slightly, you know, if you want to tell a story from scratch, you must also first create the universe, which is kind of Carl Sagan, but not so much anymore. Um, so let's talk about the universe. As a filmmaker, the frame is the, that's the thing, right? Your, your job as a filmmaker is to craft the frame. All the information, all the things you're trying to relay, all the emotions, everything is contained there. Um, but in VR, uh, if, if, uh, if you thought of it as a frame, you'd, you'd sort of be doing it wrong because you generally do this, right? The frame changes depending on which direction you happen to be looking. Yeah. So this is a, a, a very odd visual for something which embraces this idea that you can have all these possible frames that could exist. So instead of this, um, it really should be more like this. worlds of potential frames. Um, and you know, so for a filmmaker, it's like, oh my gosh, my frame is gone because it's everywhere and it's chaotic and I don't know what to do. But as we heard today, uh, consciousness can come from chaos. Chaos is actually quite a beautiful thing to work with. You can start to really evaluate the possi possibilities and potential of things. Um, and I think as a creator, you know, I, yeah, I lost a frame, but I gained a, a whole world of frames. So have at it, you know? Um, and, and so the visual becomes this. It's, this, this, it's more sphere-like, actually, but um, this at least keeps me somewhat sane in terms of evaluating things. Um, and editing in film uh, also shifts. Again, editing in film is frame to frame to frame. Um, but again, when you think about worlds, it's different. Um, you know, it's, it's this idea that some worlds change over time. It's not what they appear to be. Um, they have different elements that uh, resonate with one another. Um, there's a coordination. Um, we interact with, with, with uh, elements that exist. Um, you know, and some worlds are very similar. They have different kind of cadences. 
you know, lighting being one of those things. Um, and really, again, your job as a creator is to sort of understand how, how someone may move between these worlds, guiding someone through kind of this universe that you're, you're creating. Um, and so editing in VR isn't frames at all. It's world to world. And your job, again, is to guide someone through this universe. But if it was just about worlds, you'd just set up a rig in the middle of a place and film, and everyone would follow up in VR, and you'd be like, I did it. Um, and that's not what happens. There's actually a lot of bad content out there, because this is as far as people generally go. Um, and it sort of goes off of this, uh, you know, the saying, if a tree falls in a forest, and no one's there to hear it, did it actually fall? And furthermore, does the forest even exist? Right? So um, let's talk about existence. Um, in film, you know, again, you have your frame, um, and you have the viewer. It's like being on stage. You have me, and then you sit objectively to me. Um, and that's sort of the relationship that exists. You're safely over there, somewhat. Um, but when you have a world, it's different. I wouldn't go to my mom and say, hey, mom, you know, I went and I viewed Thailand. You know, um, I went and viewed Machu Picchu. I went and viewed the concert, right? Um, when we're present somewhere, when we exist somewhere, we visit it. And so much like um, anything in real life, you know, you go somewhere, you visit it, so you should be called the visitor. And a lot of folks still call the people in these experiences that put on these headsets the viewer, which just seems very surface. Because when you're trying to convince someone that they're there, then they should be visiting that space, right? Um, so two very specific language shifts here. Um, but, and they're simple, but they're extremely important. You go from frame to world, and from uh, viewer to visitor. And again, that's still kind of surface. Because if it was just me kind of, you know, existing with stuff, um, be a very uh, kind of bland existence, right? Land life. Um, so we experience things. And experiences enrich what we do. Now, again, this is not new. This is, ever, again, this is, you could apply this to a lot of stuff. But for VR, it's very important because experience is the thing that drives how we craft this stuff. Experience is how, when someone is actually present in a space, how we engage with that space. How do we have meaningful lives in a place? How do we validate our existence, right? We all want that. Artists, for sure, want that. Um, so again, we're going to talk a little bit about the craft here, but the, the idea that you could be looking, depending on where you're looking, you're actually determining the frame. So if a visitor is looking this way, that's the frame. If you know she's looking this way, that's the frame. If she's looking that way, that's the frame. So really, my job as a creator is to understand the potential of where those frames will fall, which also means I need to understand the visitor. Um, so we think about things like attention. Um, glacier climber again. Um, if, uh, if I'm looking here now, if I really love ice, like just flat pieces of ice, I might not really be looking at, the, uh, at that guy, I'd probably be looking over here, but I could make a bet, and a pretty good one, that if you are in this experience, if you're visiting this world, you're most likely going to be looking at the person, the only human being that exists, and the only person making a sound, which is that guy. Oop. Focus, Jess. Um, and I can use that to my advantage. If I, if I can place bets, if I can use kind of the like kind of loose probability on where someone might be uh, looking, I can then uh, acknowledge that in the next world where I meet that with something else that I would like for that visitor to see. Um, an example of this um, is a film that I did with the Montreal Canadian ice hockey team. And I'd never been in an ice hockey game before, so this was an interesting one. Um, where I use the thing that's on fire as the thing that's probably the place that they're going to be looking the, the most. Um, this is what I do. Mm. 
Now, I, I could have just rotated the next world to just be the ice hockey rink, right? Because that's the point. But then you would never have seen that guy, right? And that's the, that's the craft. That's like the good stuff. That's when I can evaluate that world and say, OK, if I know that you're probably going to be looking here, I can make sure that you most likely will see this lovely fan <laughs> right there. Um, and you know, it's not, it's not a new thing. It, we, I actually uh, sent this to my friends over at Retinad. Uh, they also happen to be in Montreal. And they did a preliminary heat map test of the film to see if what I was thinking was going to happen happened. Um, and uh, here are the results. Each of those it represents viewership there in the, that map. So there's the torch ceremony. There's the disgruntled fan. You have a couple outliers. And then he turns his attention to the rink, and they follow where he's looking. And see, that's a journey for someone. It's not that they don't, they, they get the rink because they're following this guy's gaze. And so there, again, there's this coordination and this, um, this cadence to the, the actual, um, that world and, and the situations going on in it. This actually comes from a game designer who made a, who uh, helped create a game called Myst, which maybe some of you have heard of. It's one, I'm obsessed with it. It's one of my favorite games. Um, and he said when every time he's in this headset, he'll look in the direction that the creator wants him to look, and he'll just turn and look in the opposite direction. Um, and he, he said at the time he was talking, he's like, it's shocking how little people, like, what, how little people uh, use that space. So I think about rebellion a lot, because you know, it could very well be in a, six, a 360 environment, you don't want to look where I want you to look, and I should be okay with that. In fact, I should embrace that as part of the craft. So here's an example. This is, um, what, uh, this is Kennedy playing violin semi-poorly in a room. And that's the entire point of that room and that scene, is that you're in a room with her playing violin. That's it. If you're looking that direction, cool. If you decide you're going to look in the opposite direction, you see her parents. And you hear her still. Something that's really important is I'm talking about the visuals, but the audio is also very important. You hear her still playing semi-poorly behind you, and it contextualizes her parents watching from the doorway. I'd argue that's probably more cinematic than the very literal interpretation, which is watching Kennedy go without ever knowing that her parents are there. Um, and so it's important to think about crafting in the space in the 360 environment. Think about all the other quadrants that exist. Think about what happens if someone decides, I see what you're doing, but you know what? No. Or maybe they just are wandering around having their own swell time, and they're fine with that. And you should be fine with that, too. Um, and once you understand where someone may be engaging, uh, where someone may be engaging and, and what you want to do as a response to that, um, you start to create a, a cohesiveness, uh, which was said in, in the prior talk, even if you don't necessarily get the exact pathway or the exact point, it brings some sense of cohesion, some sense of belonging to the universe that you're creating in this space and in the individual spaces. And some, suddenly you have this path, regardless, that you can pull someone through. Um, and that's really exciting because that actually makes editing possible in VR, which is something that wasn't uh, when I started, apparently. Um, so uh, you know, this is easy, right? One guy making a noise, one human, it's fine. Um, Life is complex. It's not that easy. Otherwise, my job would just be really simple. It's not. Um, so in a, in a case like this tram, um, there are multiple points of interest. There are mo multiple places to place attention. Um, and these rocks, which is just utter chaos. I have no idea <laughs> where you're looking. Um, and so you know, help someone. Um, but again, you go deeper. What's engagement? Um, engagement being how do we actually interact with the space? How do we mentally um, um, connect with the spaces that we're in? Um, so going back to this tram, um, I'm going to place bets because no one's looking at you directly, but they're looking out the windows mostly, that you're going to eventually, much like the ice hockey game, uh, turn your attention towards what everyone's turning their attention towards, which are the windows. Um, and this is where it gets really fun. Um, I came up with this system, again, if you ever play games, it's something that you probably see prevalently uh, in those, which is this idea of extending and responding with the engagement of that person. So let's talk about extending. Um, if you engage with the front or the back windows of these trams and look through the windows, I match it with looking down an alleyway of a horse stable. So it doesn't break how you're engaging. You're looking this way. It continues it with the next one. 
Um, but you can respond to it too. If you're looking out the side window of the tram, the left or the right windows, I meet you with a horse face. Um, so you're just sort of minding your own business and suddenly this horse is just like in your face. And it's, it's my way of communicating you know, <laughs> with, with the person that's there. Um, spatial awareness, uh, it's important it, you know, to, to, if someone establishes in a room where something is and then you, in the next shot, turn it, it causes a great deal of discomfort and anxiety. Um, if that's what you're going for, great. That's how you do it. Uh, but if you, um, if you want to keep things comfortable and you want to keep things uh, feeling okay for somebody, you have to be aware that if you're moving someone in a space, you kind of keep things pretty similar. Um, identity, which, you know, existential crisis everywhere, but who am I and why am I here? Um, thinking about the physicality of someone in a space. Um, again, with, with Kennedy, as a child, you've, if you were, if I was myself and Kennedy was here, and if I were in a VR space and I looked down, I immediately, looking down is immediately changing the dynamic I have with this child. I'm suddenly the adult and it's the child. But if uh, I'm her height, um, suddenly the parents are the ones that are the bigger giant folks, and suddenly I have to look up at them. And that changes my dynamic with them, but it keeps my dynamic with her, my relationship to her and her environment uh, on par with her. I identify with her, I can relate to her more. Um, in an orchestra, am I the conductor or am I the musician? Um, if I'm the conductor, uh, why is there another conductor? <laughs> you know, like, the world has to respond to who you are. You have to be careful about that. You have to make sure you don't do something sloppy or inconsistent. You have to think about these things. Um, I don't know what to call this other than enrichment. It's all supposed to be enrichment. This slide, th this presentation literally changes every time I do it because that's how fast this stuff is moving. But for now, enrichment. Um, you know, you think about experiences and, and why they matter to us, right? Why do we remember them? We don't necessarily remember the sunset. We remember, you know, the, per the people we were with, maybe what we were eating, maybe the dog that was just laying there kind of staring at a bug. Um, you kind of remember these really small nuances of things. And that's, that's what makes, you know, stuff special. Not to sound s sappy, but it's true. Um, so it's also these things that we catch at the corner of our eyes. We don't necessarily, um, when, when I present something to you, I'm like, you know, hi, I'm Jess, I work at Google and VR and stuff. But if, you know, you were to like wander through a building and hear me talking and catch it, it might be more memorable for you. It might be something that um, resonates with you a bit more. And so I try to interact with it uh, a bit in, in the space where I don't just put stuff in front of you. I, I, I put stuff just at the side of your, your vision, at your peripheral. Um, here's an example of that. Uh, that's me falling on my butt. And you know, uh, I, I, it'd be nice if you didn't see that, but the, the idea of um, the fact, if you, if you do, it's because you caught it. If, it. It's not something that I'm gonna, as a creator, say is, is an important thing. I, I want you to find it. Um, and it cuts, the film ends with uh, my producer at the time, Nick, reaching down and grabbing my hand. Um, so otherwise you're just in this beautiful beach landscape with glaciers and it's wonderful. It doesn't matter if you don't see it. But if you do, there's an Easter egg. There's something there for you. Um, we, as designers, I'm not a designer, but I play one on VR, in VR. Um, if you, uh, uh, we, we love clean, beautiful things. Um, so when and you think that in film, you know, the composition being clean is, is great. But actually what we'd rather have in VR is something more like this. And honestly, something more like this. Like if I'm actually hiding and talking to you right now, that's far more interesting because you're wondering where the hell did she go and why is she doing this? Um, but if I'm right here, you're like, oh, there she is and she's talking and I can go back to my phone or fall asleep or something. You know, you, you, there's an interest in, in the mess of things, um, in the depth of things, things in your way. Your mind engages more when there's mess. VR loves mess, um, which is, talk about anxiety, it freaks me out. I'm a bit OCD, so I'm like, uh, perception, and this one's pretty. This one's uh, huge, and I do I do emphasize human or otherwise, and it's great that Kyle and Stefan were, were talking about this as well, um, and everyone actually. Um, AI is, is very much a part of the stuff that I'm interested in um, as well, and we'll go into that in a second. Uh, Oliver Sacks um, has a really great book called Seeing Voices. Um, something I've been thinking about a lot is um, how we barely understand how each other experiences things. 
VR currently is built for, you know, and it's the unfortunate part, but it's the, the common denominator in the field is, you know, 30 something year old, predominantly male, healthy. Good, good eyesight, good hearing, can move fine, everything's great. That's not the world. That's not how we are. Um, and so one of the things I'm really interested in, um, along with the, the idea of accessibility, is how can we relate to uh, everyone else who sees the world differently than, than me, than us, than you? Um, and here's an example of, a, 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 it was a, um, a test done with, with Chinese um, children, with students, um, deaf Chinese children and ones who could see and hear. And what they did is they took a flashlight in a dark room, you sort of do that with your phone, right? You like draw characters and they, they drew these Chinese characters out. And the deaf children totally saw everything while the hearing Chinese children did not. In fact, one of them drew a two uh, and that was not one of the characters. So it was, um, it's this idea that actually as you, uh, it, uh, deaf people generally have far better visual perception. Their brains just, adapt and become better at seeing in order to compensate for the fact that they don't have the ability to hear. And there's this thing called uh, motion parsing, which is, uh, you know, in sign language, they actually see every step, much like a long exposure on a photo, of someone doing a, a saying, they're saying, you know, signing a phrase out. Um, and it's remarkable how we can actually visualize deafness if we looked hard enough. Um, there's a, pro, uh, a, a VR experience that's, that's very, very good called uh, Notes on Blindness. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's, uh, let me see if I can actually, whoop, whoop, that's too high. Um, anyway, let's see if it plays. Stand by. I'll just let it go for a second. But basically the, the idea of Notes on Blindness is uh, this guy, John Hall, who kept these audio recordings of, of like a diary of him going blind what he was experiencing. And the VR piece, which this you can is check out, one. is, um, is uh, all about the audio, and the audio itself drives the, the visuals. 21st of June, talk 1993. Sitting in the park, with the children, I hear the footsteps of people walking past me on the footpath. But further out to the right and behind me there's the car park and the sound of people starting and stopping their cars and driving off. Way off to the left there's the main road and the noise of the heavy traffic roaring past in the distance. The strange thing about it is that it's a world which consists only of so, uh, activity. I, I mean, I encourage you to see it. It's, it's really hard to see in the VR. the blind person's appreciation um, of weather. We so, uh, anyway, it's beautiful. It's, it's phenomenal. And you, you basically go through this experience of different chapters, and you get used to this visual, and the visual begins to degrade over time. So suddenly, your visual perception becomes something that you're liberated from, and it's, it's you just got to see it, experience it. Um, but this is another part about perception. We never see the world as it actually is, but only the world that is useful for us to see. Humans have a very limited perceptual ability. Like we, 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 we barely see the, you know, the frequency of, 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 of light and, and radiation. We, we, we barely hear. Um, we, we, it's a very small sliver of what, of what the universe holds. Um, and so, you know, uh, back to Deep Dream again, you know, how can we leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and the art that comes from that more specifically to then give us um, some idea of maybe other ways we can see the worlds that we, that we live in, that we inhabit. Um, so this is a, a, a research blog um, back in July of 2015. And I don't know if you uh, noticed those rocks uh, on the blog, but um, those are my rocks. And uh, the... Uh, they actually um, wanted to use some of my VR footage to, uh, to, to dream on. Um, and, and that was a bit of a result of when one of the <laughs> software engineers uh, basically did this for fun, saying, hey, you know, I took, I took one of the stitches, which is the footage you get from, from VR um, capture, 
um, and I, I put it through Deep Dream, and I, I got it, and I was like, well, um, I don't know. It, uh, the, the thing about this, though, is because, so uh, the rig that I have captures in stereo, which means when you're in VR, things have realistic depth, meaning this row is closer to me and that row is further away, and I can, I can handle that, I can, I can sense that. Um, but because the, the left and the right eye, if you close one eye and you close the other, there's a little bit of a shift. In order to achieve depth, depth you, need that, uh, you need that shift. So the top is a little bit different than the bottom. But the, the system then uh, and, uh, registers the top as a different image than the bottom. So if I were to see this in VR, the two images wouldn't um, match. It'd be kind of messy. Um, so this got me thinking, being like, well, I mean, could we do this in VR? And um, so I worked with a group that Kyle had mentioned, the artists uh, in machine intelligence team at Google, and a, a really talented engineer, Doug Fritz, uh, who, who dealt with me being pestering him about doing this. And uh, we found a way to do it. Um, so this is Deep Dream. Uh, in, in VR. Um, and the great part about this, and, and this is how brilliant he is, he managed to find a way to map the dreams, to dream up the different layers. So you actually, depth becomes more, uh, uh, you, you're more aware of depth because of the way that the dreams are uh, kind of attaching themselves to those layers. Uh, here's another example. This is on uh, Arecibo, which for all you science nerds, tech nerds, it's the, now I think it's the second largest radio telescope in the world, but um, this is, uh, I think these are snake ropes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it goes through these various stages where we go in and out of the dream. Um, and it's really just tests. They're just experiments just to see what's possible. It's going to get creepy in a second, um, if it's not creepy already. But uh, so these are birds. That's nice, right? And then uh, that's going to go out in a bit. Here's where it gets. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and then it resolves to happy pandas. Hold on, let's get there. Pandas. Great. OK, moving on. Um, but I mean, the, the thing about this, too, even in, in, when you think about machine learning, machine learning has filters, or you know, something like Deep Dream. Deep Dream has filters, too. It has parameters. Um, you have one software engineer uh, who did this, and then you have the other software engineer who did this. So you really have the ability to, in, to treat it and to work with it in a really uh, nuanced way. It's not something that you have to slather on everything either. It could be something that could be a result of uh, maybe there's, you know, someone's actually asleep, and suddenly the world becomes a huge dream with puppy slugs or with pagodas or whatever. And you can decide what that is. As an artist, you still have the agency to decide. You know, what, is, what are those parameters? What are those filters? Where does this happen? When does it? Um, and, you know, that goes into the whole idea of this journey. The overarching, like, what is, what is the overall thing? Like, how, how is a visitor th going through this whole experience? And back to the rocks, you know, chaos isn't a bad thing. We've learned that. There's, there's something really beautiful in chaos. It can resolve in really wonderful ways, but beyond that, it's a way for us to just relax. It's a way for us to just not have a purpose for a second. We can just sort of experience things. Um, and so I, and one of the ways that I've been thinking about VR is this idea of levels, much like video games or computer games. Um, you know, you don't just immediately enter Mario Brothers and fight Koopa. You'd freak out. You don't even know you can jump. You don't even know what the fire flower is. Like, you just like, what? I, what? So you go into Mario Brothers, and the first thing you do is you hit a, you know, a question mark box, and you get a coin. And then you get a mushroom, and then you grow, and then you stomp on a little mushroom guy, and you realize you can kill things like that, and you should. Um, and you start to learn things along the way. You're not, you know, it's, it's my job as a creator to, to understand where you're coming from and understand how I can pull you along. So one of the things I use the rocks for is this idea of like a landing pad. It's like a demo world. It's like the first level. Um, you know, I'm in VR, oh my gosh, is usually what people do. Um, so giving them anything specific would be a vast, it would be a terrible mistake. But the second level I can do is give them a sense that it's 360. Introduce spatial audio. So they go from a very calm situation, they just sort of hang out, to suddenly they're in this new spot, they hear something behind them, and the general thing we do when we hear something behind us, because we freak out, is to turn. 
and suddenly it opens up the entire world. Suddenly we understand audio is something that we can pay attention to, and we have a tool. We have our mushroom, right? Um, and so what I did in World Tour was this. You start with the rocks, which is just, you know, onboarding. It's 360 spatial audio. You understand that this is a 360 experience because people do need to be reminded of that. Um, you're on the tram where you have the windows. Then you have the horse stable. You got um, Arecibo, which is where you actually get to relax for a second. You know, you've been sort of following things. You can just chill out and be there. I reorient, I reorient, reorient you in this. Uh, there's some chess players actually at the bottom there. Um, I reinforce it on a boat that's moving towards the shore. Um, I surprise you. Here's the thing. People get bored. Like, maybe some of you are that way now. You just, like, you eventually just want, like, some sort of massive thunderclap or something to make someone remember, oh, right, I can turn. Because sometimes people just sort of relax and they just sit there. And you just need something that's going to knock them out of that. It happens to all of us. Um, and then, again, I reinforce it with this geyser in Iceland and then me falling on my butt or not, just beautiful black glacier beach at the end. Um, so that's sort of how I think about the journey. Energy and atmosphere is another thing that's important. The energy of a space drastically shifts depending on culture. Like my mom is Singaporean, very different when she's in a room with people than it is if my dad's in the room with people. Different shift. Um, the uh, same thing goes with engineers. You have a group of engineers at Google I.O. This is like our developers conference. We release Jump, we release the camera. I turn on the camera right afterwards, and this is what happens. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have time for you. Is the, and you just feel so, I mean, objectified, but you're a piece of technology, right? And that's, that's the thing. You, we, don't, we think of it as, OK, a person shows up as soon as they put on a headset. And that's wrong, fundamentally wrong. As soon as you press record on a rig, that person is there. It is a human being in that space. So if people are treating you like a plastic, rig with 16 GoPros in an array, it's because that's how you are. That's what you are, you know? Um, so it's important when you build these worlds to consider that. This is how, this is the energy. This is what's going on. Compare that with the first stitch that I showed you, which is also a group of engineers. You are also a piece of plastic with 16 GoPros, um, but they love you. And they are so glad that you work. You know, like, what a feeling. I felt so good because of them. Like, I felt so good because that was the space I was in. That was the kind of energy that was being directed at me. Um, and it's vastly different. And it's very important to understand that that will resonate with somebody. And that is an important part of this craft. Yeah, they do a lot of walk around. Uh, in real life stuff. OK, we are not at the point where VR just exists and we don't do anything with our bodies. We, we wear things on our face, and we walk around, and we move. Um, so to, to completely ignore that fact uh, is, is wrong. And, but there's something really kind of interesting about how uh, you know, there's, there is a kinetic sculpture possibility right here, um, which is uh, really what's the coordination of someone in a physical space? What's the physic like, what am I doing in real life? Like, what's going on? What's the space around me when I take it off? What happens when I? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, MIT. Uh, so um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, and so something that I do really consider is what are you doing physically? Because I do not want you to be like, oh, I'm not going to turn around because I'm too tired because I turn around all the time. Like you want to have. So it's like dancing. I need to have the understanding of the dance. And, and what is it? Is it a waltz? Does it get boring? Is it like I don't care and then you're just confused? Or is there some moments where I let you go and do your thing and sometimes when I bring you back? Um, and, and so this is world tour. It gets vastly more complicated than this, but this is generally what it is. I know the red means that you, I'm expecting you to turn around 180 degrees. I do not want to do that all the time. That's just my, I just, it physically isn't comfortable for most people. So if I see a lot of red, I'm like, okay, I got to go back and reevaluate what I'm doing here. It gives me a good understanding of what's going on in the experience, and it gives me a sense of the universe. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is, is the apple pie, which is the story, which is the thing that, you know, we try to skip to, but again, this is important that we get to it now after having heard everything else. It's not storytelling. That's the thing. It's, it's, it's different. Um, and this is why. In storytelling, we have an experience. 
you know, the experience affects us, we leave it, and someone comes along and says, you know, what happened? And I filter the experience I've had, and I present a thing to that person or persons, and that's the story, and the medium in which I, is the way in which I do this, and I myself am the storyteller, because I have filtered out that experience. Um, BR is different, and here's why. And suddenly, doesn't matter what story I've got to tell, the person's in the experience, right? So I can't be like this, and then I look and the person's already doing their own thing. So I can't really be the storyteller, and the medium suddenly becomes a bit wonky. It's not really what it was before. But what happens in this situation is that a person goes into your experience, they're affected, they leave, Someone comes along and says, what happened? And they said, oh, I went and did notes on blindness. And there was this, like, these blue lights, and it was crazy, and the rain happened, and I saw everything. And suddenly, I find myself removed, but in a good way, because suddenly the medium has become end-to-end -end the experience to the conversation that happens there. Um, and the storyteller is the person who visits the experience, the visitor. So I'm trying to enable storytellers. I'm creating storytellers by creating these experiences. Um, and there's two story states that really exist. The first is kinetic. Um, and again, I, if you think it's because I got it from science, it's because I did, and I don't know what else to call most things. Um, but kinetic story is what film and books and music and theater um, and game design, all of that is, is because it's, it's filtered experience. I, as the creator, am actively telling you something about what's happened to me or something that I'm thinking about in my brain based on experience. Um, but there's also potential story. And potential story is the understanding of how experiences will affect someone and then create other stories that they will then tell to someone else. It's a magnitude out. Again, you think you lose it by not being a storyteller, but you gain a whole new perspective. Um, and there's a, it suddenly becomes three-dimensional. Um, so really, VR is potential story. And it's not even a little nugget, either. It's something that kind of looks like this, I guess. It's, it's this idea of um, this kind of a mash between, you know, what I think is acceptable as a possible story and what you will most, you know, what you will tend to experience. What are the permeations of stories that exist? My, again, not to use my parents, but my mom going into an, uh, an experience will be very different than my dad and different than me and different than my sisters and different than Kyle, probably. Um, so, uh, sorry, Kyle. Uh, so the, um, but this, the, the idea of um, that story, there's not just one story. We go into an experience and there are variations of stories. And I have to know as a creator what those variations could be. Um, and it then becomes even more complicated, because why not? But the idea that you can, it could be completely visitor driven, just experiential. No expectations, no real story, just go and have at it, have fun. Um, it could be a collaboration where there's an ebb and a flow, where sometimes it's about experience, but other times it's about something more specific. Again, the dance becomes more complex. And then creator-driven, which is more like film, which is where I've, I kind of don't think is, is, it's not the best area, I think. I kind of like the middle. But, you know, it's creator-driven. It's like, I decide that you need to look here, here, and here, and I'm going to do everything I can to direct your gaze. It becomes more film-like, though, the closer we get to that. So something to be aware of. Um, so. To work backwards, story um, is, uh, validates our experiences. Um, our experiences validate our existence. And our existence validates the universe. Now, I'm still thinking about this, because there's a lot more to think about. But like, I, you know, I'm using pure circles, but I mean, if you look at Alexander Calder's you know, mobile work, it's it's phenomenal. You start thinking about, well, maybe, you know, these, these shapes aren't circles. They're, um, they're more anamorphic, and they, they morph and change depending on where the interactions are. Could I potentially work with that? And some of them may branch, but others may go in different directions. Do I create other universes, multi-universes, for there, to, for there to be story um, to exist? And again, AI and machine learning come into that as well. Um, and how do they all fit if they're so different? Um, Studying kind of varying natures of things and seeing how they're still part of a cohesive whole is very exciting. Um, that's, a, that's something that I'm interested in as well. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, Calder makes something like this, and this is the latest visualization of our universe, right? This is the universe. 
So there's a lot of things within science and research, stuff that actually exists that we're learning more about are our own physical existence that can then um, in some way inspire the way that we, we see something as powerful as VR. Because VR is really, I mean, beyond experience and existence, it's presence, it's, it's all about the things that make us tick as humans um, and why, we, we, why we're here you know, <laughs> in the first place. Um, and so as I, as I learn, um, I'll, I'll keep you informed, I guess. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. You explained capturing the viewer's attention and focus, but how would you transfer emotion through the screen? Mm. So a lot of what I think about is um, unpacking what elements are doing. So if you think about, um, I used a bottle of, of water as an example the other day. I, I kind of use like various things. and. It's like, okay, either, either I direct your gaze towards a bottle of water, or maybe a bottle of water, what I'm trying to get at is, is thirst, or uh, wetness, or um, plasticness. <laughs> um, uh, and in which case, I would try to, um, I, we have a phrase in film, mise-en-scene, um, which is really just the, how do you um, craft the space? Um, and uh, you would basically try to craft the rest of the space to reflect the elements of that bottle of water that I think are, are, are important for you to, to gather. But it could also, again, it could be energy, uh, love, uh, anger, excitement, um, you know, maybe insanity in some cases. Like you can really start to, um, you, you think about emotively how an environment um, and the tension in an environment uh, helps to translate those more complicated things. If VR films become more popular, do you think there will be a big shift in filmmaking practice? No. I think. I think filmmakers, what, what's happening is that most filmmakers are going into virtual reality thinking that it's going to be filmmaking and it's, that's the biggest problem. It's more, I think VR is going to turn off a lot of filmmakers who aren't really wanting to change. Um, and you'll find that a lot of the best VR creators won't probably be filmmakers, although they'll be the first at the gate because that's what we're most comfortable with. Um, you know, we were talking about it yes, yesterday a little bit. It's the idea that, you know, we unfortunately, for better or worse, it's, it's nice to have familiarity with the equipment, but the equipment um, asks to be treated as a rig and not as a person because we're used to using cameras as cameras um, and not used to, you know, carrying around people with us, um, unless you're a mom or a dad. Uh, and and I, think, uh, I think that that's an important differentiation and it's something that's going to take some time. I think film will always be around because it's an important you know, it's an important medium and it has a place um, and uh, it's very powerful in its own way. One of the things, it's actually, um, one of the things that we also do a little bit wrong, but I think it will change, we always expect that, oh, VR is going to be the thing that you, you come home after a long day and you're going to sit back on your couch and do VR. Um, and uh, you, you don't. It's like, you know, the last thing you want to do is put on a headset and do anything. You just want to, like, kind of you know, watch TV and just like tell me things, I don't care. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, what I actually do, VR is quite meditative, actually. Um, it focuses our, our attention on specific things. We, we somehow are able to, I mean, we block out the rest of the world and we're able to focus on a, a particular thing. So I actually find VR better to do, <laughs> this sounds weird. I find virtual reality better to do during the middle of the day uh, because it actually re, it, 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 uh, it causes me to, to be more conscious of things and to be more pointed about things. And I feel much more energized. So I think that films will serve their purpose and their way of escapism, but I think that VR isn't so much escape as it is reflecting also on how we interact in real life. Yeah. yeah. What parts of the VR experience are you trying to develop through new theory to understand? And will, you, will new tech beyond 360 video require new theory? What parts of the VR experience are you trying to develop? Basically, all of all of that. I mean, I think well, in terms of um, in terms of the actual like tech, I guess it's editing. I think could be more dynamic. Um, interactivity, you know, being able to you know gaze tracking is something I'm interested in. Um, unlocking branching potential stories, I think, is is cool. Um, there's uh, you know, every time you add another layer, though, I mean, it's good to have the basics down because otherwise you start to overcomplicate things too early. 
So one of the things is like, you know, you add interactivity and suddenly you have to think of, do I give them interactivity right away? Do I slowly build up that knowledge? Do I just give them all the tools outright and then hope that they find them? I mean, it becomes a different, um, different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, positional, which is moving around a space also like, you know, I think movement is, is, a, is a, it could be a narrative layer, but it doesn't necessarily have to exist all the time. So do you always move? Can you stand still sometimes? Is that anxiety, does that give you anxiety? Like the, it, it's a lot. So it, it's just important to at least have some grasp of each step as you move forward. A great talk we had there. A lot of good questions. Uh, yeah. We're glad that you're here today. You're our only female talker this year. Yes. I know, right? Where are my ladies at? What's yeah. up? <laughs>